This is what we call the afterburn. Okay, we're going to have two mics going around. No, we're going to try this. Okay. Okay, Amy, do you want to go first? Okay. Thank you so much, Rabbi. I really appreciate it. Um, when I was sitting here this morning, uh, one of the th there's a theme I keep hearing, and it's all about loyalty. Like, where does our loyalty lie okay. in um, all the decisions we make, the actions we take? It's always demonstrating who we're loyal to. So when you talked this morning, and, and you said, oh, when you were in the church, you know, you used to do this, you used to do that, you used to do all this other thing. Now you come over here and you don't want to do anything. Or you want to do, well, maybe this, but not that, whatever. And I thought, yep, that's, that shows loyalty. And <clears throat> Yahweh's asked us, you know, if, if he opens our eyes and our ears, this is just, you know, my way of understanding it, that he's saying, you need to be loyal to me and you as our teacher, you're continually showing us what we need to do to demonstrate that we are loyal to him. And if we continue to keep company with people that want to be involved in other things, you know, they've been here and they left, et cetera, et cetera. You know, that just shows, a, to me, is a mixture. And when you bring that in, it, it just doesn't go well because Yahweh doesn't like a mixture. And it, it causes a lot of confusion and division. I mean. And, and there was, I was just trying to think there was one more thing. That, I don't know, I can't remember right okay. now. But it was all about, it's all wrapped up in loyalty. Oh, I know. And then, you know, we were also told and taught that Yes, well, we make our own individual decisions and choices. They affect the rest of the people, but we often don't remember that because, as you said, we're so busy being selfish people. I so I, I just wanted to share no, that. I appreciate that. Thank you. Okay, no problem. I appreciate it. Okay, so, so look, yeah, you can clap for that. All right, so look. Two things, one is absolutely loyalty is like the biggest thing. And when we did the color code, the personality test, you know, all of you probably have at least a good amount of blue in you, okay? And loyalty is a big deal to the blue. And that's good. The problem is when you don't know how to balance, when you have two things you could be loyal to, which one you should be loyal to, okay? Because you may have friendships and that person you're friends with leaves. So you have a loyalty thing going on. And then you have this group or me and the things that are going on here and there's a loyalty thing there. But now when, what happens when there's two options to go with your loyalty? How does that work? And that's when you have to use your mind. Really, there's a more intellectual, rational part to that than the emotional side to use your thinking process, wisdom and discernment to recognize where your loyalty should be, okay? And that's hard because loyalty is a really big thing, especially when you're close to somebody. And it's hard to, to go. But if you really care about them, then want them to go through whatever they need you to come back, not just to maintain a relationship with them now out there because you should want everybody to be in here, in, inside the covenant. I don't mean just in here like MTY, whatever. You should want everybody to be in the covenant, not outside. Now, of course, you could be susceptible to the watering down that's going on in some of the other ministries around here that, well, everybody that believes in Messiah, even if they don't quite get the Torah thing, well, they're all in covenant. They're not, okay? Covenant is a covenant of obedience and the obedience is to Torah. That is the covenant, end of story, period, that's it. All right? And don't start like, where's Messiah? That is all Messiah. He's the law giver. He's the full, he is the end of the law. In other words, this is what the law looks like in an end result. If you walk this out, that's what it looks like, Yeshua. Okay? 
So when he says that, when it says that Yeshua was the end of the law, yes, that is what it looks like in the end when you do it. It's not the end of it, meaning it's no longer there to do. It's like, if you do it, this is what you can expect to look like when it's over. It transforms you to be like him. And that's what it becomes, okay? And loyalty is a big deal with Yahweh, and loyalty is a big deal with Yeshua. But we have conflicting loyalties, then we get in trouble when there's conflicting loyalties. And that becomes a problem, okay? And then th there was something else that, um, I'm trying to think what else Amy said. There was, some, there was a second thing I wanted to comment on, I can't remember what it was. So just like you couldn't remember the other thing you wanted to say, now I can't remember what I want to say. So if, I'm sure it'll come back and I'll remember it. So we'll go to Brianna in the meantime. Brianna. On the note of uh, loyalty, in verse 10 of 2 John, um, when you said it said not to greet people, is that is more saying like those people can't be in your inner circle, but they can be your acquaintances because you really can't not interact with people who aren't covenanted because it's kind of impossible to not. Okay, good question. And I have one more question. All right, well, let me answer your first one. That way I won't forget. So the first question is, look, it says not to greet them as in welcoming them in your home. It doesn't mean that if you see them in the store, you don't say hello. That means, it doesn't mean you're going to shun them. It doesn't mean that you're going to just, you know, avoid them so you don't run into them. But you're not going to be greeting them like those that have the relationship you used to have when you would welcome them in your house. Okay? So hopefully that's clear. So yes, you are likely in this neighborhood because a lot of people that used to go here still live here and you're going to run into them at the store or wherever you're going to run into them. And that's fine. And if they, and if you feel it, you know, if you feel up to it, you certainly are welcome, not obligated, but welcome to say hello and you're welcome to greet them, etc. But this is talking about a relationship of breaking bread together. There's a different level of fellowship that we're talking about as opposed to just being polite. You should always be polite. All right? Okay, what's your second question? Well, you um, kind of went over verse 4 of Second John. You just kind of passed over it, but I don't know why. It just, I thought of something kind of a deeper connection more than just a Peshat level. It's talking about how he rejoices with the children who um, are walking in truth. But I thought of every, all of the time you're just talking about the sower and the seed and I was thinking about those fresh people in the walk, not making excuses for themselves or not like being in it fully just because they think that they're new or they're children of this walk, they're new in this walk. So they decide to make excuses for themselves instead of just being that good ground and ready to fully walk this out. Because even the gear would walk this out and they were just watching in a sense. So not making excuses, what I just thought. Okay, appreciate that. I mean, look, you know, let's understand also, it says, I found some of your children walking this out, not all of them, because Abba works with them at different times in different ways, but he was excited to see that some of them had embraced it and were walking it out. And so that was great. Okay, appreciate that, Brianna. Thank you for the question. Okay, um, hold on just one second. I want to kind of rotate back and forth a little bit. So, Rob? I got it couple from Waffle, Steve Waffle, he's up in the kitchen, so he, he texts me a couple comments here. <laughs> Says, uh, we should focus on the quality of dirt we should become, not focus on all the dirt we can find and share about each other. Well, I like that. Very good. And then the second one is, uh, we can't receive being full of ourselves. Narrow is the way. The more we shed of ourselves, the more we become as he expects of us. Okay, appreciate that, Steve. Excellent. All right. Oh, and I remembered um, for Amy. Okay, Amy had mentioned something about serving and when you're here serving. Two things. One is we still have people that will come to Billy or come to one of us and say, I'm here, man. I just want to help, and then we'll offer them something to do, and they'll be like, well, no, not that. <laughs> which is again, you're not really available. Okay, you're wanting to filter it. Instead of just saying, he nay ni, here I am. Because that happened this weekend already. That happened yesterday. Okay, somebody showed up, I'm here, I wanna help. And then they were told something like, well, no, not that. 
What else you got? Stop doing that. Just be available. Okay, and the other thing is, and this is really disappointing to me, just like when they were taking up the offering for the tabernacle, there was so much they had to turn it away. I don't understand why we still have empty slots for volunteers. Why we are not turning people away because there are more people than what we need wanting to help. I don't get that. Why is it that almost every time we have a microphone opportunity, we have to announce that we still need more people for something? There's almost 200 people here. We need eight or 10 to do something, and we have four people volunteered to do it. I don't, well, but you might miss something. Well, no, you, yes, you're gonna miss out on whatever you could have gotten out of volunteering. Yes, you are going to miss something. All this stuff is recorded, you'll see it. But see, you're still thinking about you. And some of you are gonna go through this whole weekend and not volunteer once. And I'm gonna tell you right up front, you should be ashamed of yourself, okay? And I'm not gonna sugarcoat that at all. Okay, I've got Chuck, who can almost not walk, cutting vegetables the other day, standing in the kitchen, okay? I've got other people with other issues, at least trying to find something to do. And you're gonna tell me, and now there are a few of you that really legitimately can't do something, I get that. So don't feel, get, those are the ones that are gonna come to you crying and feeling all terrible. The ones who should feel terrible won't. But I'm telling you, you should be ashamed of yourself. You come every feast, every week on Shabbat, and you don't help at all. That's the kind of forever community you want to be a part of? Yeah, because everybody takes care of me. You're not going to be there with that attitude. And I want to say this, and this is a great praise, and the rest of you don't get this praise, but the eight of you that volunteer all the time over and over again for 15 slots, you get it. All right, I'm gonna clap for that. You guys get it. Because every time we ask to fill a few empty slots, it's the same five people that have already served six times already, raising their hand to come up and do more. And it's almost 200 of you. We don't have 200 slots that need filling. It shouldn't be this tough. And some of you that are local congregation members, I've never seen you do a thing. I think of people, now you're gonna all go back and say, Rabbi was mad. I'm trying to take a tone of voice to get your attention. I don't get angry about these things. I'm trying to puncture through whatever cloud and noise and fog is in your head. Billy can tell you, because Billy's the one who's always on the mic going, we need six more people, we need eight more people. He should be saying, that's okay, I got enough. That's okay, I got enough, because too many people come. All right? The eight people that always volunteer are clapping, okay? All right? Or the people that never volunteer are clapping, but then they're still not gonna volunteer. I, I, again, I don't get it, okay? Why are you here? Well, I like the teaching. Okay, so you wanna receive. What are you giving? Well, I put money in the box. Well, who cares, keep your money. What are you doing? You're missing the point, okay? What are you doing to participate in the body? There are opportunities. You should be, you should be showing up worried that you won't get fast enough to the list because all the slots will be full. Okay? That you should be hurrying up to get to the board to make sure you can get your name somewhere so you can do something to serve. Oh, but that's not gonna happen. Because you're not ready. You need to grow in that area. Okay, so Rob? From Norma Silva, uh, 2 John, verse 10. Uh, this means not to get in conversation with, with Yahweh knocking, out, knocking at our door or family members with different beliefs or is it just about having closer relationships with them? I, I think you answered that. Okay, already. I did answer it. Look, it's not about the people that are outside the camp as much, okay? Remember, he's talking about those that were led astray, that were in the camp. This, John is talking specifically about those who left the camp. He's not talking about those who never were in the camp. You are much, 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 much less susceptible to those who were never in the camp than you are to those that are kind of, sort of, in but out type of thing, okay? 
Especially if you've got your own little bitterness you haven't resolved about me or somebody in the ministry, and then somebody gets your ear and you're like, oh, somebody else doesn't like what happened there too. And now you're kind of pulled in that direction. Okay, one more, Rob. Okay, from Lydia. It says, how do I stop myself from being offended by others? How do I stop myself from feeling let down or defensive when someone causes conflict and argument discussing Torah? And then she uh, follow up, does, do you have any tricks on not becoming offended over Torah? All right, so, you know, I get this is the kind of stuff I spend like 80% of my day dealing with, all right? And I'm not picking on the person. This is, this is the most common stuff. We have to do the, you know, some of you think, why don't you do more teachings with more verses? Why are you doing all this internal stuff? Because this is the stuff you guys struggle with. You get offended for the same reason that I've said over and over again. You get angry for the same reason. You get disappointed for the same reason. Because it's all about you. Only you can get offended. Only you can prevent forest fires. Okay, so, okay. I mean, only you can get offended. It's the you part. It's the me, me, me gets offended. Okay? If you can get you out of the way, you can become a selfless person. There's nothing to offend. You don't have to be offended on others' behalf. They can handle themselves. So don't be offended for me or for others or for Yahweh. Or like some of you think like you need to defend Yahweh in the, you know, on Facebook and everything. He doesn't need you to defend him. If he needed you, <laughs> all right, I don't need to even go any further, all right? He doesn't need you for anything. He desires a relationship with you. He doesn't need anything from you. Everything he can do himself. What he can't do is have just a relationship only with himself. He wants others to have a relationship with. So he desires, but he wants them to be people like Yeshua to do that. He doesn't want the emotional cripples that most of us are. And so many thinking, well, I'm never getting here then. Stop that. Let's dig our heels in and, and get committed to fixing our emotional weaknesses. Just realize it's not personal. Go back and listen to the beginning, I believe, of developing the character of Yeshua. I talk about the two trees and I talk about a selfless person, okay? Selfless person cannot be offended. Yeshua didn't get offended. What did he say on the, on the stake? Forgive them, Father. They don't understand really what they're doing. So Yeshua wasn't offended. All right? He had a little bit of some righteous indignation to get in the faces of the Pharisees and the money changers when he flipped some tables over. Like, get this stuff out of my house. But that's the way anybody would be in their house. This stuff doesn't belong in my, who told you you could bring this stuff in my house? Listen, I'm in my house and somebody walks in and brings some stuff that doesn't belong in my house. I might say, who brought this stuff in my house? I'm not offended. I want to make sure I get their attention so they don't do it again. See, Yeshua was being strong for emphasis. Just to make sure he made his point clearly. Instead of walking around going, oh, excuse me, I really would rather you guys didn't do this money changer thing here in the, you know. He flipped the tables over and said, you guys have turned this place into a den of iniquity. You guys are doing unequal weights. And you guys are stealing and cheating in my house. That is not appropriate. Exit, stage left, okay? Get out. But for the person who asked this question, you're going to have to become strong inside. Look, I don't want to sound... New Agey, I don't want to sound Buddhist or Hindu or some other philosophy out there, but you need to understand this is reality. You can only control inside here. You cannot control other people. You cannot control other circumstances. You can't control anything outside of your body. And if you would ever just fully embrace that you literally can control everything inside, then you would recognize that you can choose to be angry or happy at any moment, joyful or sad at any moment. You could choose because you have full authority inside here. 
but that person spit on me. So you still have a choice on how you react. The body got wet. That's on the outside. The inside, you still have free to do whatever you want. Okay? And you need to find a way to own and embrace that reality. And I've taught this to you for months and months and months now. The reason you're looking for tricks, techniques. All right, we'll make it simple. I came up with this phrase a long time ago, so if you ever heard anybody else say it, I started it. Okay, no. Memorize this. It's short and sweet. It's all mind over matter. If you don't mind, it doesn't matter. I've been saying that for 50 years. All right? Since I was a little kid. Because somebody say, well, how come the blah, blah? I said, it's mind over matter. What do you mean, like mental strength? No, I just don't mind, so it doesn't matter. It only matters if I mind. But you may think it matters. Well, that's true, but I don't have to feel the way you do. And I have a lot of people that always, they look at me a lot, of, why aren't you all upset about this and that? Because to me, it doesn't matter. And you don't understand that. Like I said, I've had people feel they were torn up for months about something they said to me or something they did, and they'll find me three months later all wanting to apologize, and I'm like, I don't even know what you're talking about. Because I didn't mind, so it didn't matter. It didn't bother me. I haven't been all mad at you now for months because of some whatever you think you did. All right? When I get loud, it's because I'm trying to get a message through to you. I'm not angry. I'm not. I can turn it right to this quiet smile anytime I want. But I'm trying to get your attention. But you'll misinterpret that. But what you need to understand, though, is when you're contacting me, yes, I can give you techniques and I can give you things that can help you work on you. But it's got to start with you wanting to own that it's you that's the problem. Nothing outside of you is ever really the problem. Now, there are things outside of you that may be a continuous temptation to have a problem, and you may want to avoid those things and stop allowing yourself to be constantly in those situations. But you choose your response. No, I don't. They made me mad. Nobody made you mad. They offended me. Nobody offended you. You chose to feel offended. You chose to be angry. Well, why would I do that? I don't know. <laughs> Why would you choose to do that? I look at some of you and I'm like, you've made it impossible for you to ever be happy. And some of you look at me like, that's right, I don't know how to be happy. It's a choice. It's a choice. But how can I be happy, blah, 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 blah. Because you made rules that I can't be happy unless all these things are a certain way. Change the rules. I wake up in the morning, I'm alive, I'm happy. But well, my back hurts. Well, I'm happy my back hurts. I could be dead. But I'm happy I'm alive. I have all these bills to pay. Well, I'm happy I'm alive to pay bills. Could be dead. I'm happy I still have time to work this out, walk it out, transform, and everything else. That's enough that should make you happy. But I'm alone, and I'm lonely, and I don't have any friends. But if you were dead, you would never have the opportunity to still have all those things. So be happy. Don't do it already. Be happy now. Little Bobby McFerrin action there, right? Okay. All right, your turn. Before I get to my main point, you mentioned about Hine Ni. Hine Ni. I'm oh. here today. So, the reason why I am doing this is because I want to obey the Father's commands. And also, I, I am, I, anytime I have money, that I can save up, I'm going to save it for the feasts and other important events because he gives us the opportunity to make the pilgrimage. And I, I want to be here. And I don't want to be cast out into the lake of fire because I disobeyed the Father's commands and he was not pleased with me because I was not doing the things that he wants me to do. I don't want to see him 
take his hands and throw me into the lake of fire. I don't want that. Amen. I'm not a young chicken anymore. So I don't know when I'm going to leave this earth. I want to be ready and prepared when that day comes. I don't want to stand before him and he says, depart from me. I never knew you. I don't want that. Amen. That is a very terrifying experience. Well, it should be. And I think a lot of us should really embrace what you just said. Yes. But we're talking about people who are not, co who are not in covenant. So I, I have, there is a couple that I know. They've been married a long time. And I've known them now for almost seven years. You said, <laughs> don't break bread with them. Don't go to their house. Don't have a meal with them. Don't talk to them. No, no. Look. If somebody, they're specifically talking about a very specific group of people. If there are people that are now going into the place of being of the anti-Messiah, they're, they're pushing an agenda that's, now remember, they're starting out with people that started out covenanted. Okay, that's what, you know, he's talking about, he says, look, they are now in the leading astray, where they're trying to get you to either do things that you shouldn't or at least water down what you know you should do and they're pulling you in a direction. Those people you don't want to spend time with. Those are people you don't want to break bread with. Okay? It's not people that are in the world, have always been in the world and you happen to be friends with them and you go and have a meal with them. Okay? okay? All right? And they hopefully get to see your light shining. Yes. All right. The don't break bread also goes to one of the verses that Paul writes talks about that a reviler you should not even break bread with. And revilers are those that are actively attacking those in covenant, okay? And so, as long as the people that you're dealing with aren't reviling, and they're not trying to do the leading of astray, the leading astray type of thing, then you can go ahead and eat with them. I also wanted to say they, uh, they're interested in coming here for one service. Is that permissible? Of course, of course. Look, we're, we are open and welcome to anybody to come. Especially, how else are they going to know what we're doing here and maybe be interested if they don't come? I mean, I know they can watch the live stream. It's not the same. Okay, it's as close to the same as you can get it, but it's not the same. And, you know, but the thing is when they come, depending on if they decide to come more than once or twice, we'll, we'll be always at least paying a certain amount of attention to what they do when they're here. Because we do very rarely, thankfully, but occasionally although very rarely we get people that come and they have their own agenda and they're trying to put, draw people into whatever they've got going on and that's not acceptable okay okay and i want to say one more thing i'm not mm -hmm. i'm not just when i first wore these tassels i was very uncomfortable and i always wondered what are people going to say i'm wearing these and at some point i decided no He's the one who told me to wear these, and I have no reason to be ashamed. Amen. And now I'm going to wear them, whether people like them or not. I'm going to tell you something humorous. When I was at the Chattanooga airport, I was going back the last feast. Not this air, not Chattanooga. I was in Louisville. I was at the Louisville airport for another, for another event, and I went up to the TSA. Uh, area where they ask you to, to, to take all, out your pockets, take off your belt, take off your shoes, all of that. And he told me, he said, take off these tassels. I looked at him and I said, oh, he said, oh, is that for religious reasons, right? I said, yes, that's what it's for. <laughs> there you go. Which is why, this is why I go, this is why yeah. I paid the extra money for the TSA pre-check. They don't ask me to take <laughs> off anything. It was worth every penny. Yeah, okay. All right, well, appreciate that, thank you. Thank you. All right, very good. Very good. Okay, Rob, well, we'll, we'll get to Janice and we'll go to the live stream here for a minute. Okay, by the way, let me just say this with the, with the seat seat, I just wanna add one little thing. I've been wearing seat seat for a long time, okay? And I'm, I'm not kidding if I tell you probably 
less than one hand's worth of fingers is the amount of times anybody's asked me about them. So all you guys are afraid. Now, that's not to say how many times people look to wonder what they are. And probably two or three times I went up to the person and said, it's okay, you can ask. Because I see they were staring at them trying to figure out what they were. But really, it, it, I, my experience, it almost never actually comes up. The people that are going to ask, if anything, are people that you actually already know who are used to you not having them on and wondering, well, what's up? Well, now you, if you've ever wanted an opportunity to kind of share a little bit of your testimony, you know, you could touch, the, touch that water just a little gently by going, well, you know in the Bible where it talks about, and then when their eyes glaze over, you know that you've said enough. Because that's almost always been my experience. Because I always start off with, you know in the Bible where it talks about, and then they, they realize, oh, he's going there, I don't want that. Okay? But I'm telling you, three, maybe, in 20 years plus, what else? I mean, three times, maybe somebody asked me about them. Otherwise, no. It just doesn't really come up. But you're afraid. And, and you're afraid because as a guy, you're thinking, guys don't want that much attention to what they wear. Okay? Unless they're putting on something they want you to see, like they got the new jacket or something, right? But generally speaking, they don't want to be looked at and judged about what are you wearing, on, you know? And let's face it, when you first start wearing them, it doesn't occur to you in your secular mind that this is a manly thing to do. Okay? Now, to me, it's an incredibly strongly manly thing to do at this point. But I can imagine in the beginning when people put them on, it doesn't seem, you know, tassels from clothing. That's like ladies have stuff hanging from their clothes and stuff like that. Guys don't do that kind of thing generally. So it doesn't feel like, and so emotionally, we get uncomfortable. Instead of looking at it like, he said it, I'm doing it, that's it. If anybody's going to look at me funny, I'm going to be like, hey, I'm just listening to him. You got a problem, take it up with him. See, but there's still too much you there to get offended, to get nervous, to get embarrassed. Because only you can get embarrassed. You get the you out of the way, there's nothing to get embarrassed. All right? Because you're a perception that people will look at you and judge you and... So what, all right? If you don't care what they, have, what they feel, then it doesn't matter, right? Mind over matter. If you don't mind people looking at you, then why would it matter? I expect people to look. Look, when I used to wear the yarmulke and the seat seat in Knoxville, Tennessee, automatically everybody thought I was a rabbi, which I was, but that's, only a rabbi would be wearing and walking around Knoxville, who doesn't have a whole lot of Jews, you know, with seat seat and the yarmulke on. So people would walk up, are you a rabbi? <laughs> As a matter of fact, I am, there you go. <laughs> Because that's how odd it was to see somebody Jewish and wearing, the, wearing those things. Okay, uh, Rob. I know, well for me, I'm, now I'm always looking for them. You know, before I, I didn't even know what they were, but now, you know, I think somebody had mentioned this a while about years ago and you go in a grocery store or in a store or walking around, you see somebody with a lanyard hanging out of their pocket and they're like, oh, is that a, oh, no, that's not a Z, it's just a lanyard. <laughs> No, I know that exact experience, because when we went to our first Messianic conference in 99, um, it was at a hotel with a swimming pool. We were there early. It was in Florida. It was hot. I went into the swimming pool just to cool off, and a guy walked by the pool with seat seat on. I got excited, like, hey, look, it's one of us, you know? And I started up a conversation. So it, it's, it's, it is great when you can find other people, and you can start up a conversation. And then you'll find out just what kind of mess they actually follow, but they're wearing seat seat. But anyway... You can usually tell by the colors of the seat seat if it's probably heading in that direction. But anyway, <laughs> all right, Rob, go ahead. From uh, Pete and Brenda Lamb, uh, question, is that transforming into his image also what is being talked about in Mark 12, verses 16 and 17? Mark 12? Verses 16 and 17. Mm, not exactly. This is more about authority. This is where it talks about whose image is on the coin. It's Caesar's. And he says, render unto Caesar. So it's not about transforming. He was simply trying to say, look, there's that which is a Caesar and that's the world. And there's that which is of Elohim and that's Elohim's. Okay? So that was more about saying, look, there's two different groups of authority here. Give that authority what it deserves and make sure you give the other authority what it's supposed to get. Okay? Rob, you got more? Let's go. Okay, from Allison, 
It says, uh, how do we know Yah is leading us away from our family to come closer to relying on him? It's, it's not about knowing Yah's leading away or this or that. He's leading you to become more like him. And in doing so, there may be some family members that are totally okay with that. There may be some family members that are completely not okay with that and everything in between. And so you may lose some family and friends over this, all right? Okay, like my family, for example, keeps nothing, but they're Jewish by birth, but they keep nothing. And they, they're totally care less what I do with this. So they, they support it, they encourage it, they don't care. And so that's my experience. Now, of course, they don't want me to talk about it. They don't want me to bring it up. They don't want me to make any issues of it. But I'm welcome to do whatever I do. But you may have some family members. Look, in the South, if you live here and were raised here, probably half your family is a pastor at one point or another. Okay, I've got people calling me, you don't understand, Rabbi, my mother's a pastor, my father's a pastor, my uncle's a pastor, my sister's a pastor, my brother's a pastor, my great-grandfather's a pastor. Okay, so I get that. Those people may have more of a problem with what your decision is to walk this out. And so you may have some of them that don't have a problem, but it's going to be case by case, all right? Next. Okay, from Yanni, so uh, second, verse 7 of Second John, not confess Yeshua as coming in the flesh. What about the Jewish people? They don't believe Yeshua has been here. Scripture says the scepter is with the Jewish. Okay, remember that what we're dealing with here, when we deal with the Jews today, okay, you got to remember in John's day, the Jews were just, the way they did what they did, they were just another sect of Judaism, so to speak, okay? So it wasn't looked at as a very separate thing, but it was a, you know, because there's lots of different sects of Judaism, just like today there's lots of different sects of, of Christianity. Now, generally, it's gotten to the point now in Judaism where there's just really mainly three or four major, you know, you got your Orthodox, your Conservative, and your Reform. But even within those, there's different flavors, especially in the Orthodox, right? Different flavors of what that looks like. And so in the day that John is writing this, he's talking about those who've come into belief or walking out the commandments and they understand about Yeshua. Now, bear in mind that throughout the centuries, the Jews being called Christ killers and the Jews being blamed for all these things made it really tough for them to believe in the Messiah that was being, under the, in the name of that Messiah was being used to kill them by the millions, all right? So let's not worry about the Jews. Abba has a plan for them. They will be just fine. Paul tells us of the Jew first. They do have Messiah. They just don't embrace him as having come in the flesh. They keep the Torah. They embrace the Torah. Well, the observant Jews, right? And so they're embracing him in that form. Just like, and they, so they're not really covenanted the way they need to be, but they will be fine. Just like I think most Christians will be fine. Most of them are embracing that Messiah exists, died, came in the flesh, died, and was resurrected and sits at the right hand. But they have not embraced the Torah part. Okay, so these are incomplete understandings of Scripture and the relationship with our Creator. The, both groups over time as Abba works with them, most of them will probably be fine. But they will have to embrace the half they're missing. Okay, is that clear? Does that work for everybody? So don't worry about them. Don't judge them. Just like don't worry about the Christians and don't judge them either. Don't be judging anybody. You got a plank in your own eye that needs plenty of work. Focus on that. Okay? All right, next. Yeah, first off, thank you for a wonderful teaching as usual. Um, and thank you for reminding me of uh, developing the character of Yeshua teaching because about two days ago I was thinking about your teaching on Tree of Life uh, and I was, I knew I had listened to it but I couldn't remember which one it was it so that was really cool, I made a note of it, I'm going to go back to it. When um, you were saying that there's people who are not respectful uh, when they approach you, that they're actually disrespecting him and they're not res disrespecting you. Um, would that apply the same if I'm not respecting my husband, I'm not respecting him? Would that is equivalent? Or? It would be, it would, look, it would be applicable um, in the same way, but in a different way. And the reason I say in a different way is because you're, you're looking at me in a very specific role that I was called to do, 
and you have recognized his words coming out of my mouth. Your husband is a man you selected because of his role as husband. If you disrespect him, you're disrespecting the way Abba designed that relationship, but it's not the same as him being anointed and appointed. It's a different thing from that point of view. But on the other hand, you did choose him. Abba intended a husband to have a certain authority and role. And when you disrespect that, you are disrespecting the Elohim in that manner. Okay? okay. Just like the men, if you're not providing and, pr and protecting and doing what you're supposed to for your wives, then you're not honoring Elohim either. You're disrespecting because he intended them in that role to be treated a certain way. Mm -hmm. Okay? Mm -hmm. yeah. So yeah, so it's, it's similar but different in other ways. Right. Okay? Yeah, I have a couple more points. So when it was on 12.2, when he was talking about renewing your mind, it's really uh, embracing what you taught us that mind is emotions and, th and thoughts, right? That this mindset is the mind, the emotion. So it's really doing the inner work is what we need to do when it says renewing your mind so you can align it to his mind. Right. Correct? Okay. Just a clarification. And then there is something that I wanted to ask you, I've heard some people refer to Rebitzin with her first name, and that is that correct to assume that that's not respectful, that we should be using the, I mean, her title? Yes. Or all right, so, well, first of all, let me just go back to renewing the mind thing for just a half a second, which is, look, think about renewing as doing a factory reset. Because you've now junked up that hard drive, okay? So maybe that's a better, because people think about renewing and they may think of it in all kinds of ways. Really, your mind isn't working right because it's been filled with things that don't belong in there. And so we want to do sort of a factory reset there. And as far as respect, you know, there is a certain level of respect and in terms of how you address people, and it's changed over the years with different types of people. Like, for example, it used to be that everybody said sir and ma'am. Okay? I, I worked with some people in Canada, in their culture, anybody that was more than 10 years older than you, they, you call them Ms. or Mr. Okay? So they, they weren't ready to call me rabbi, but they called me Mr. Berkson because I was older than them. Okay? There were ones in their 20s whose weddings I was doing, that kind of thing, and so they would call me Mr. So a lot of it's cultural. But it's respect for the position and for the anointing or for the effort. For example, I don't feel it appropriate necessarily to walk into the doctor's office and call the person by their first name, unless they've told me to. But they've earned the title doctor. They put in all those years of work and effort, etc. And so out of respect, I call them doctor so-and-so. Okay? Because that's what... Now, they may want doctor in their first name or doctor in their last name, but whatever it is that they, that they respect. So the same thing with calling my wife Rebitson. You know, some of you may have known her before we started really embracing using the title for her and just know her as Julie, Julie and, that's, and that's a challenge for some of you. But it really, your mindset looking at her and interacting with her is different when you call her Rebitson than when you call her Julie. And your mindset with me is different when you call me Rabbi than when you call me Steve. All right? Okay? And I know there's going to be some people that are all kind of bent out of shape about the rabbi thing. It's because you don't understand what Yeshua was talking about in Matthew 23. Listen to the teaching that I have, which is called, whatever it's called, do not be called rabbi or something like that, okay? It's an in focus. You can find it. Just type that in with MTOI and it'll come up. And I explain the whole Matthew 23 problem with the whole rabbi thing. Now, that being said... You know, there are some of you that still, it's funny because there are people that were here called me rabbi all the time, and as soon as they leave, they're no longer calling me that. And I get that because they don't want to now give that honor and respect because they don't see me that way. Now, one of the things I have said was, if I'm not your rabbi, then you don't necessarily have to call me that because it's actually a possessive term saying, my teacher, okay? And so if I'm not your teacher, why would you call me rabbi? So you can look at it from those different levels. And actually, I've joked often, and I've said, look, you know, only the highest level in the Jewish sort of perspective, the sages are referred to by their first names. Okay? Otherwise, they had titles like rabbi. But when you talk about Rashi, Rambam, and these kind of things, they were called in that way. 
okay? And actually, Rambam's a title. It's, it's an acronym for the name, okay? For, for Moses Maimonides. But the thing is, the title helps you have a mindset that you recognize who you're talking to. And look, and I appreciate very much that my best friend attends this congregation from a distance and then is here to help Uncle Bob, we call him, right? And he will, on the phone with me, nobody else around, he calls me rabbi and calls my wife Rebbitson. And I've known him 20 plus years. And he shows that respect and we're, we're goofy best friends and do all the kinds of things you expect goofy best friends to do. But he still refers to me that way, okay? And so if my best friend could do it, certainly you could do it. And he, if anybody could feel comfortable calling me just Steve, that would probably be somebody you would think. But he doesn't feel that's appropriate. Because it also reminds him that even though we're best friends, and even though we get goofy here and there, I still have a position of authority in his life that that reminds him about. And that it reminds him that the, the Father speaks through me to him from time to time. And that puts you in the right thinking, the right mindset. And for those of you that want to come here and show up and just call me Steve in front of some other people, some other people here may, may take offense. I apologize for them, but they really don't appreciate when that happens. And that's not because I've told them that, but they're very protective of the respect issue, all right? Especially Rabbi Tom, so don't do that in front of him, okay? <laughs> all right, not going to appreciate that. All right, so hopefully that answered that question. Okay, uh, Grayson. Uh, so I had a comment that I wanted to share on what you said about being able to control internally what was happening, no matter like what the circumstances were. And I know that you said that you can choose to be happy when, and just uh, to be happy because you're alive. And I know for me, there was a period of my life where being alive wasn't necessarily something that I was happy about. And so one of the things that I know I always think to whenever I'm having a bad day, whenever I'm frustrated, no matter what's going on in my life, I get to think about the fact that he chose me and he gave me the opportunity to live and like live in like the full sense of the word. And he revealed Torah to me and he revealed Messiah to me and he gave me all of this and he allows me the position to be a life for others and, that I, and, and the responsibility that that brings. And when I take the time and I recenter and I think about that, no matter what else is going in my life, I find a way to be happy. So I just wanted to share that. Amen. Thank you. All right. So, all right. So I was I was not limiting, and I'm glad that Grayson brought that up. I wasn't limiting like the only way you could feel happy is that because you're alive. There's a lot of people that I deal with that would rather not be at the moment, but that you understand that you find a rule or a thing that if this is in place then why wouldn't I be happy? Look, I think we should all be happy knowing that at some point we might get some chocolate. That's something to look forward to. Matter of fact, I know that Kurt has a piece for me waiting. So you told me you had plenty. Don't tell me you ate that piece. Okay. So, you know, look, I've got a big safe in my office and in it is my M&Ms and my little chocolate bars. Okay, so don't laugh. It's true. All right, but find some little thing even. It could be a big thing too. I mean, Grayson used a big thing, recognizing he called me. I mean, he actually personally opened my mind and my heart, my eyes and my ears so I can understand all this. What greater joy can there be than that? Okay. See, but some of you are thinking, why did I take the red pill? Did you notice the colors of the red pill and the blue pill? <laughs> okay. I'm not going to go there and tease any more than that. You figure it out. You make your own joke out of that. Okay, but the red pill brought you into reality. <laughs> okay. And by the way, it wasn't necessarily a joyful thing. Reality was a little rough, but it was reality. Okay. And there were those that would rather be in the delusion, wanted to go back and take the blue pill. Do you, do you want to be in reality? That's, that's the real challenge. It's the real challenge. Okay, anybody else? Okay, back to Rob. Hello. All right, from Curtis Hacker, 2 John 
2 through 6 is John commenting on Yeshua also saying stay in him as he stays in the Father. Seems kind of obvious, but just want to make, yeah. make it clear. You can make that connection. That's fine. Yeah, you can definitely make that connection. Because remember, everything must maintain vertical alignment. So you can't say walk like Yeshua, follow Yeshua, be like Yeshua, and miss the fact that that's because as he walks like the Father. So you can't go with me telling you, do what I'm telling you, follow what I'm telling you, and be like your teacher, not knowing that that means you're being like me, which means you're being like Yeshua, which means you're being like the Father. Okay? It's all about pointing to the top and imitating. Paul says only, he says, imitate me as I imitate Yeshua. All right? Anything else? We're good? All right, good. So we'll have about eight or nine minutes before we break for dinner here so we can close up.